Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on critical materials. We're at Code Modular, located here in Houston. Thank you for joining us on the holiday season. Uh, today we're going to be talking about extracting uh, critical materials. So as you may be aware, over the years we've seen an increase in clean energy technology development as well as other high-tech devices. Therefore, the demand for minerals, metals, and rare earth elements utilized in the manufacture of these products has outstripped supply. At the table on the right from the DOE, plus the criticality of materials as it relates to the importance of energy and overall supply risk. Many of these coke modular direct experiences, such as lithium, cobalt, nickel, magnesium, to name a few. Our subject matter experts will discuss coke modulars Solvent extraction technology, which replaces traditional mixer settlers, offering an advantage solution for the recovery of critical materials and aiding to meet growing demand. Our presenters today are subject matters on extraction technology. Um, Don, our manager of extraction, will be speaking first. He holds a BS in chemical engineering from Rensselaer Polytech Institute and an MBA from Fairleigh Dickinson University brings over 30 years of experience in evaluating and optimizing extraction processes and scaling up and design of extraction systems. Supporting Don will be Brendan, our principal extraction engineer, who holds a BS in chemical engineer, uh, engineering from Columbia University and brings over 15 years of experience. Brendan is responsible for extraction application evaluation, process development and pilot test design, extraction column design, commissioning and process startup. So a little bit about Coke Modular, if you're not familiar with us, we're a joint venture with Coke Glitch. Uh, we bring over 40 years of experience uh, to the chemical processing industry. We support most uh, industries, whether it be specialty chemicals, mining and metals, pharmaceutical. If there's a chemical involved, we, we support that industry. Uh, our core capabilities are divided into three buckets. First and foremost is process engineering. Our companies comprise mostly of chemical engineers and companies come to us either at FEL1 or FEL2 stage to help them uh, fully bake their processes and solve separations challenges. And also they come to us for our extraction technology, which, we, which we'll be talking about today. Second, they come to us for our pilot plant facility located here in Houston, Texas, with over 5,000 square feet of pilot test uh, space. There we can run pilot testing to support uh, proof of concept selection and commercialization and scale up activities. We basically take drum quantities and process that at our pilot plant. And both Don and Brendan will be talking more about our pilot plant shortly. And ultimately, uh, we do deliver our projects modularly, so we don't stick build anything. There's various um, benefits to building modular, uh, which we can always you know, answer your questions at a later date if you have any. Uh, before we get started, we did have uh, two poll questions. Uh, let me let me share the first poll question. So on the right hand side, you'll see um, the poll questions. Uh, basically, you know, how familiar how familiar are you with liquid to liquid solvent extraction? Uh, are you familiar with this technology? Uh, maybe you've heard of it, but you're not familiar, or you're not familiar at all, and uh, you know, you'll be learning a lot from this. In this webinar. We'll just give everyone a few seconds to answer the poll questions. We see some coming in now. Let's see, we're just about there. Okay, looks like the majority of you all are familiar with, with uh, liquid to liquid extraction. Looks about 21, 64% are familiar. 30-ish uh, 30, 30 percent have heard of it, but not familiar, and about 3 percent are not familiar. Great, thank you. And the next question is, you know, <clears throat> as it relates to the recovery of, of critical materials, are you familiar with the application of extraction technology for the recovery of critical materials? Let me um, share that poll question. So again, are you familiar with that application to the recovery of critical materials? Um, maybe you've heard about that application, but not familiar or not familiar at all. So it 
let's see what we're seeing here. Okay, great. So it seems like there's a few more that are not familiar with that application, so that's good to know. Great, thank you. Thank you for answering those poll questions. Um, you'll see a chat window on the right-hand side. As we go through this presentation, if you do have any questions, please enter those, um, those questions in the chat window. And at the, end of the, at the end of the webinar, we'll answer as many questions as we can afterwards. And then if you may be asking, will we, will we be providing a copy of this presentation? We will be providing a copy after this presentation. Thank you. I'll hand this over to, to Don. Uh, good morning, everyone. At least it's morning here in New Jersey. Uh, so to start out, we just want to make sure that everybody's familiar with what extraction is. <clears throat> this slide shows basically uh, the simplest form of liquid-liquid extraction. You have a feed and a solvent that, that are immiscible, and you have something in the feed. We would call that a solute. In this particular example, it's component C. So when you bring the feed and solvent together, you mix them together, you're affecting a mass transfer of that solute from the feed into the solvent. And then you want to separate the two phases after that you've transferred to reach steady state. And when you get what we call an extract phase, that's the solvent that has picked up the solute. And then you have a raffinate phase, which is the feed that has given up the solute. So basically what you're looking at here then is what we call one theoretical stage of liquid-liquid extraction. And one of the key factors in, 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 in evaluating this is the distribution coefficient, which is how well the solute, which in the critical metals, we're talking about probably metals, how well it distributes between the solvent phase and the feed phase or the extract and the raffinate. So the distribution coefficient then is the concentration of the solute in the extract divided by the concentration in the raffinate phase. <clears throat> Obviously, the, the best extraction is to find a solvent with as high a distribution coefficient as possible, you know, for the material that you're trying to remove. Then we have something called an extraction factor. That's just the distribution coefficient times the solvent to feed ratio. We typically target a minimum extraction factor of about 1.3. And, you know, I'm not going to cover exactly why in this seminar, but there is a good reason for, you know, targeting that. And then in especially in metals extraction, we have something called a separation factor. That's when you have various components, very, a number of solutes, different metals, for instance, in your feed, and you want to separate them. And you use a separation factor, which is the distribution coefficient of one metal divided by the distribution coefficient of another. You know, obviously the better the separation factor, the less stages you're gonna need to do that separation. So we have two ways we'll point out about doing liquid-liquid extraction. One is by using a series of mixer settlers. And you see what we show here is four in series where the feed comes in on the left side and the solvent comes in in the fourth stage on the right side. And then that solvent becomes the extract from the fourth stage going back to the third stage and so on in a true counter-current fashion. So, <clears throat> Again, this would show four uh, agitated stages of, of a mixer settler. However, our strength is really in column type contractors. <clears throat> Here, instead of having a series of mixer settlers, you have a single extraction column. You bring the feed in one end of the column and the solvent in the other end. We're showing this case, the feed being the heavy phase, so it would come in at the top of the column, the solvent being the light phase, it would come in at the bottom of the column, and then as these two phases flow counter currently in this column, you want to do something in here to create theoretical stages, which every theoretical stage then would replace one of those mixer settlers. In an extraction column, you have two phases. You have a continuous phase and a dispersed phase. In this example, we're showing the feed come in, it fills the column, so it's the continuous phase. The solvent comes in, it's broken up as droplets, which flow up through the continuous phase, to a primary interface at the top. So that would be the dispersed phase. And selection of continuous dispersed phase is quite critical you know, to optimize the performance of an extraction process. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> 
we like to generate liquid liquid equilibrium data as i showed you in the pre the first slide uh, the liquid liquid equilibrium data is the distribution coefficient we like to use a round bottom reaction type flask as shown in the picture that's jacketed so we can put the feed and the solvent into this vessel at a specific ratio the jacket can control the temperature we then would mix these two phases together long enough to reach a steady state or equilibrium and we find that could be as low as two minutes sometimes it is a little longer so when you reach steady state you turn the agitator off you let the uh, two phases separate you take a sample of each phase you do your analytical and that gives you your distribution coefficient at a specific uh, concentration we we'll put the braffinate back in it's at lower concentration put fresh solvent back in mix it again separate it again and we like to do that process as many times as necessary to get from the feed concentration to the raffinate concentration that you're looking for. Uh, typically, we look to do it maybe five or six times. So in addition to the raw data, the, the distribution coefficient, another thing we're looking for when we do this work is how easily these phases separate. When you turn the agitator off, is it seconds or is it many minutes or even an hour or whatever for these phases to separate? That's very critical to learn during this stage of, of your uh, process development. We also like to know what's happening at the interface. Do you form solids at the interface that drop out of solution? Do you have an emulsion band as the two phases do not wanna separate instantaneously? You know, all of these qualitative observations are really important for Coke modular as we look downstream, especially to what type of downstream equipment, uh, specifically what type of extraction column we want to use in scaling up in a, any extraction process. So when you're doing these mix and decants uh, in that vessel, what you're really generating is your equilibrium curve shown here on the right. Why being the concentration of the solute, say the metal in the solvent phase or the extract phase and X being the concentration in the feed or the raffinate phase. So every time you mix and decant, you're starting at a higher point on this blue line and generating a point lower and lower on your equilibrium curve. Once you have that, now you're say you're operating your extraction column where your feed comes in the top, solvent in the bottom. Now you can, once this reaches steady state, you can generate your operating line. Now this the operating line, the upper point on this operating line is here at the top right. That's where the feed comes in, the concentration of the feed and where the extract goes out. The other end of the operating line down here, that's where the solvent comes in and the raffinate goes out. So now you draw your equilibrium curve, your operating line, and you use like a McCabe Teal method to then step off the theoretical stages that are gonna be required. Now I'm going to let Brendan take over talking a little bit more about uh, specifically what is used for metals. Thanks, Don. So often when you have a metals or critical mineral solvent extraction process, um, you have an extractant and a diluent. And the extractant and the diluent comprise a solvent in most of these processes. Um, the most simple definition I can think of for an extractant um, is an organic reagent inorganic liquid that reacts with a metal, which allows it to be extracted from the aqueous phase to the organic phase. And the diluent is the liquid um, in which that reagents dissolves. And typically this is a petroleum distillate. The classic example of a diluent for many metals extraction processes is uh, kerosene. On the bottom of the slide, we're showing a very common extractant. Um, this is copper extraction using a uh, phenolic oxime extractant. Here we have two of those on the left and right on the bottom picture of this slide, and they form the complex with copper, which allows it to be extracted into the organic phase. <clears throat> so you may be wondering how to select an extractant and how to select a diluent. I think the first thing to do when you're looking to select an extractant to perform some testing and develop a solvent extraction process is just to conduct a literature search at first. Um, if you're developing a process, there's a good chance that um, other researchers and industries have looked into similar applications in the past. 
and by conducting this search, it can kind of narrow down extractants and typical processes for what you're trying to develop. Once you have that narrowed down a little bit, um, the next thing you want to look at for is how effective that extractant could be at extracting the metal out that you're interested in. And really, that's the distribution coefficient that Don talked about earlier. Um, if you have an aqueous stream that has lots of other components in it, like other metals, you also want to have be mindful of how selective the extractant may be at um, extracting the metal that you're interested in versus the other ones. Um, and this is really where the separation factor comes into play that Don also talked about a little bit earlier. You also want to be mindful of the cost of the extractant and how available it is. Um, over the years, some extractants that were produced years ago that might be a good fit may no longer be produced. And if they're no longer produced and commercially available, it's going to lead to a very expensive process. So it's something you always want to have kind of in the back of your mind as you're developing a process and looking for an extractant. You also want to have a feel for, if possible, um, how easy it is to transfer the metal in, from the organic back into the aqueous so you can produce a product stream with that metal so it can be recovered downstream to solve an extraction process. That's a little bit harder um, to, to learn from literature search, but sometimes it's talked about. Also, kinetics and stability is something you want to be mindful of as well, if you can find that information. Um, kinetics, I really just mean how quickly it'll form that complex with the solid so it can be extracted, because that has to happen first before it can actually be pulled into the organic phase. And then if the extractant is stable, um during operation and what may impact degradation like oxygen temperature ph if that's a concern there's not as many keys i don't think for selecting a diluent um ideally you want to use something that's cheap commercially available um, has low miscibility in the aqueous so you don't have to spend um, or incorporate a lot of unit operations to recover it and you also want to be mindful if it has an impact on the extractant. Certain diluents can degrade um, the extractant, um, and it can impact its selectivity as well. So many of you have probably seen these. These are extractant isotherms, and, and Don kind of mentioned this earlier when he was talking about performing liquid-liquid equilibrium tests. As you perform tests, you can generate these, um, and these are also published in literature. And this will also help you easily select an extractant or a series of extractants for developing a process. And you can, usually they're shown kind of like this, where you have percent extraction on the y-axis and then pH on the x-axis or a function of the acid cool concentration, like chloride concentration. Um, these are available in literature um, and the manufacturers of extractants like BASF, Salt, Salve, and Itilmach also publish these in their technical data sheets, which can be requested from them. Um, it's a really good way to select extractants, um, to find ones that extract the metal that you're interested in and how selective they are prior to performing liquid-liquid equilibrium tests. Also, by looking at these, you can kind of put a process concept together, say a block flow diagram of a series of extraction columns as you're developing the process and before performing liquid liquid equilibrium tests. They don't by themselves provide kinetic data. And um, often I think they can be a bit misleading in terms of how easy it is to strip a metal out of a loaded organic stream. So that's the extract of the metal in it. Um, and because of that, performing liquid liquid equilibrium tests are absolutely critical. Um, but this is certainly a good starting point in developing a process and selecting extractants. And with that, I'm going to turn it over back to Don, who's going to go through some of the uh, the common types of extraction equipment in our technology um, that can be used for critical minerals and metals extraction processes. Yeah, this slide just is an overall coverall slide that shows all the types of equipment typically used for liquid liquid extraction. What we have in red there is what we as a company typically would supply. And and really, we look, we primarily focus on the rotating and reciprocating these type of agitated extraction columns, although we have, in fact, provided mixer settlers, you know, in some instances for liquid liquid extraction. <clears throat> so this is uh, basically what you see here on the left. 
I've been in copper mines, and this is kind of what you see in a copper mine uh, if you're doing copper extraction. And it's very large uh, vessels, a couple of thousand gallon mixing chamber, <clears throat> large settling chamber, Olympic sized swimming pools almost. And so they're so large, that's why you only see maybe five or six of these out there in the field. But they handle very high flow rates. They're good for processes that have a reaction extraction because you control the residence time in these mixing chambers. Pretty easy to control the pH as well. Some of the drawbacks are the large floor space required <clears throat> and also the large solvent inventory. That becomes a pretty critical a component of your capex is loading the system up with solvent when you start up. <clears throat> So typically, like I said, typically you're going to get only a few theoretical stages in large mixer settlers like this. As far as we're concerned, we have two major types of columns we like to promote specifically for uh, metals extraction. And that would be the first one is the Scheibel column. <clears throat> it's shown here on the right. I'll show you some actual uh, internal pictures in a minute, but it's a series of turbine impellers with a lot of baffling. So a very efficient extraction column uh, is, in fact, it's the most efficient column based on data published in the literature. Capacity is reasonable. Uh, we're showing it uh, to be, you know, maybe 15 to 25 meters cubed per meter square hour. That's if you take the feed rate plus the solvent rate and divide it by the cross-sectional area of the column. That's one of the things we find out during pilot testing, by the way, uh, when we're scaling up. And it also has an excellent turn down, down to four to one. I say here it's best suited when you need a lot of theoretical stages. That's because it's a very efficient extraction column. In organic extraction, we typically see maybe four to six agitated stages for theoretical. In the metals extraction, it tends to be a little bit more, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten 10 agitated stages per theoretical stage. But that's still very efficient when you're putting it all in one place like this. And that's why we've done some it says rare earths. We've done some rare earth extraction in uh, Scheibel columns like this. We don't highly recommend this for fouling systems or systems that tend to emulsify, although it will handle those. But I'll be talking about our car column in a minute. And that's really the device that works best in those types of systems. So what you see here is the internal cartridge for a Scheibel column on the left. This you're seeing the what we call the inner baffles. <clears throat> and then the turbine impeller between those inner baffles. The outer baffles would be welded to the inside wall of the vessel when this is slipped in. And that's because this is six and a half feet in diameter. Anything bigger than six foot, that's the way we build it. However, if it's gonna be less than six foot, <clears throat> we typically make a full cartridge. Now here you can see what a full stage looks like. You have the outer baffles with a Teflon edge. So when we slip this in, that's what's going to seal it at the wall of the vessel. And then you can kind of see the inner baffles and the turbine impeller in there. So if you look over here, you can get a pretty good picture of what the turbine is. It's just a flat blade, blade uh, turbine impeller, uh, but very, very efficient, like I said, for, for liquid liquid extraction. The largest car, uh, Scheibelcom we built is uh, the shown here. <clears throat> this was a 10 foot diameter, about three meter diameter column. You can see it was 130 feet tall, 40 meters. You can see it when it was set up on the right there. So what could, this would typically handle maybe 650 to 700 gallons per minute combined flow of bulk phases. So you put pretty, pretty large throughputs through a column of this size. The other column I wanted to mention, of course, is the car column. Instead of having rotating internals, now we have a plate stack that reciprocates up and down, okay? It has a very high open area. Therefore, the capacity is somewhat higher than a Scheibel column. Its efficiency is not quite as good. It has a good turn down, but the key to the car column is the uniform shear mixing. And with a uniform shear mixing, we create a much more uniform particle size distribution inside this column and therefore we find that this mixing action works best when you have systems that have slow phase separation and tend to emulsify very easily so you know again if if, if the interfacial tension is low if the density difference is low typically the car column is going to be a better device for those 
Also, we've been able to handle suspended solids very easily in a car calm, up to 40% slurries we've put through car calms. And that's because there's nothing, that, there's no dead zone in here. This whole plate stack is always moving. And so it will handle solids very, very nicely. This you're seeing here is a plate stack that is just under a meter. You can see it's a whole series of perfect plates. And they have, you can see one here on the left, large holes, large open area. And they're spaced in this case about 50 meters, uh, 50 millimeters apart. On this plate stack, we also have spider plates. You see one, uh, the one on the end over here, but there's three of them on in this plate stack, one on each end, one in the middle. So that when we put it together with these tie rods, that's what makes this a rigid structure inside that column. And then on the right there, you can see this was a very tall plate stack that was getting ready to be installed inside an extraction, a car column. Here's the largest car comm we've ever built. It's a seven foot in diameter, which is just basically just about a little over three meters. And you can see this was, again, is being raised by a crane to be put inside the extraction column. Another interesting thing you can see in this picture here on the left is that we have uh, varied the spacing between the perf plates very dramatically from one end of the column to the next here. And that's because when we tested this, we optimize the performance by changing the mixing intensity, you know, at different locations inside this column. So that's something we learned uh, during pilot testing that we're gonna talk about a little later on. And with that, I'll turn it back to Brendan. So I'm gonna go through two classic uh, metals solvent extraction processes. Um, and how we can use agitated extraction columns like a car or a shival <clears throat> um, in place of mixer settlers for those processes as they're kind of tradition traditionally designed. So the first one is a copper solvent extraction process. And this really um, is just two unit operations from the extraction perspective, extraction and stripping. So you have a copper ore or waste stream that's contacted with um, some acid, which is kind of on the left-hand side of the slide. That forms a pregnant liquor, an aqueous stream that's rich in copper and is very acidic. That goes to the extraction step, which is shown in blue. Um, that pregnant liquor is contacted with an organic solvent um, containing a diluent and an extractant, the extractant probably being one of the licks uh, series of extractants. That generates a stripped organic which has copper within it, um, that stripped organic, leaving that extraction um, step goes to a stripping step where the loaded organic here shown as this um, is contacted with an aqueous solution. And that aqueous solution takes the copper out of the loaded organic um, and generates an aqueous stream that's rich in copper. That stream can go to an electro winning step downstream um, which will, will pull the copper out of solution and spent electrolyte or water leaving that electro winning step goes back to the stripping step. So not only does the stripping step um, yield kind of a copper aqueous product stream, but it also regenerates a solvent that can be used back in the extraction step. So if you were to design this process using um, agitated extraction columns like Scheibel or Carr, it would look something like this. We have the aqueous feed coming in here on the left, um, going into the first extraction column where copper is extracted out of this pregnant liquor stream um, with an organic solvent uh, containing an extractant and a diluent. Loaded organic leaves um, that extraction column and it flows to the stripping column. An aqueous stripping solution goes into the top of that stripping column, yielding an aqueous product stream rich in copper. And it also generates regenerated solvent, which flows back to the first column. And an aqueous raffinate stream leaves the bottom of this column, um, which could go back to that reductive leach step um, upstream this process to contact the ore and, and generate the pregnant liquor. Another classic um, solvent extraction process is the recovery of cobalt and nickel from an aqueous feed stream. 
Um, on this slide, it's shown with a series of mix of settlers, 12 in total. Um, and it's kind of divided into four different steps, two extraction steps and two stripping steps. So on the right, um, we have the first extraction step where we're looking to extract cobalt and nickel out of the aqueous feed stream using an organic solvent. Leaving this step is an aqueous raffinate stream, which will contain some impurities. So really here you're liberating the cobalt and nickel away from the impurities in this aqueous stream. That flows through step B, which is a stripping step, which pulls the cobalt and nickel out of that loaded organic stream, which then flows on to step C using a, a stripping solution. And then the regenerated solvent from step B flows back to step A. So again, counter um, to extract cobalt and nickel from the feed stream. Moving on to step C, here's where we strip cobalt and nickel. Um, or we have cobalt and nickel coming into this step where it's, it's extracted. The cobalt is extracted out using a different organic solvent. Um, and then it's stripped out in step D. So leaving step D, you have a cobalt product stream that's an aqueous solution. And then leaving step C, you have a raffinate stream that's rich in nickel. So leaving this process, you have two product streams, really a cobalt for a cobalt rich uh, aqueous stream and then a nickel rich aqueous stream. So if you were to design this process using extraction columns, it would look something like this. And this is a little bit easier to follow, in my opinion. So looking at um, column A, which is the extraction step here, we extract cobalt and nickel out of that sulfate feed solution. That loaded organic stream flows to the next column um, where it is stripped out um, with an acidic aqueous solution. Um, leaving the top of this column is the regenerated solvent, which flows back to column A to extract the cobalt and nickel out. And then also leaving column A is that aqueous raffinate, which contains those impurities in the aqueous stream that were coming into the process. Looking at columns C and D, um, now we have this aqueous stream containing cobalt and nickel, leaving this stripping column. We want to extract the cobalt out of that, so we're using a different solvent here. Here we extract cobalt. We have a different loaded organic stream that's now rich in cobalt. We have different stripping solution here. This is most likely just a neutral water stripping solution. This yields a stripped liquor, which is rich in cobalt, so this is one product stream here. Um, and then we also have regenerated solvent going back to column C for cobalt extraction. And then the aqueous raffinate stream leaving this, like the other flow diagram, is a nickel-rich product stream. So you may be wondering why use solvent extraction, agitated solvent extraction columns versus traditional mix with settlers. And there's a lot of reasons to take this approach. Um, one is an overall reduced installed cost. So a single extraction column can replace greater than 10 mixer settlers. And because of that, you're just going to have like one rotating piece of equipment as opposed to say 10 mixer settlers where you'll have a rotating impeller for each of them. And since it's a single extraction column performing um, the same operation as 10 mixer settlers, you'll have less motors, less pumps, instruments, and piping are required. And typically, like Don was discussing earlier, um, a, a bank of mixer settlers is going to take up a fair amount of area. And one extraction column by itself would take up much, much less footprint. Um, also related to just the inherent nature and design of extraction columns is that you're going to have less solvent um, used in the system. Um, and there's a couple reasons of that. You can add additional theoretical stages, which will reduce the solvent to feed ratio. So by that alone, you're going to reduce the amount of solvent in the system. Also, in an extraction column, you basically only have one settling section at the top or the bottom of the column, as opposed to a series of mixer settlers, which has a settling section for each. So because of that, you're going to have way more volume. And so because of both those things, you're going to have a reduced solvent um, volume requirement for an extraction column, as opposed to a series of mixer settlers. And because there's less solvent, you're going to reach equilibrium much faster. Um, as a system will process and reach steady state just because there's less volume and less residence time within that system. Extraction columns by their nature um, are completely enclosed 
So because of that, um, they're inherently kind of safer designs. Um, quite often, now I would say older mixer settler systems can be just open to the atmosphere, which makes them hazardous. Um, extraction columns, you know, by their design are completely enclosed, so they're safer. Um, and they can also be incorporated into modular systems, which is our typical approach. And um, control systems could be designed for um, additional process safety. Like Don discussed earlier, um, if you have a process that has a strong tendency to emulsify, one of the benefits of going with an extraction column is that you can use a car column, which is the perfect fit for systems that have that tendency. If you have a mixer settler with a rotating impeller, it may be difficult to design the system to run well and also not emulsify both phases. Um, <clears throat> Also within an extraction column, you have a single controlled liquid liquid interface at the top of the bottom. So anything that can happen at an interface, and Don will touch on this a little bit when he talks about pilot testing, like a rag layer, crud builds up, um, or an emulsion band, that's only gonna happen in one place within an extraction column, as opposed to say you had six mixer settlers in series, it could happen at the interface in all of them, which can be problematic during operation. Pilot testing, uh, Mauricio touched on a little bit and Don's gonna discuss further, but we have a dedicated pilot plant in um, Houston for developing solvent extraction processes. And it's really critical to, um, to run a pilot test. We run pilot tests here often with both Scheibel and car columns. Um, and we use that to scale up to commercial designs, which are often with a process performance guarantee. Also, as, as Mauricio mentioned in the uh, beginning of today's presentation, Scheibel and car comms can be easily incorporated into a modular system. Um, and those can be delivered to remote locations. Um, and they typically have a small footprint associated with them. So another benefit there is if you're looking for whatever reason to have a process with a small footprint associated with it, say you're looking to put a process into an existing chemical plant or within an existing building, um, Extraction columns being modified are really beneficial for that. And with that said, I'm going to turn this back over to uh, Don, who's going to discuss pilot testing. Yeah, so we we are very we're very important. Pilot testing is very important to us, and you can see in the black there when we can run a successful pilot test, we can give a performance guarantee for any liquid liquid extraction equipment that we supply. <clears throat> And there's a bunch of reasons that, you know, you can't design accurately without running a pilot test. And there's some of them are just listed right here, you know, not knowing which phase should be continuous and which should be dispersed. Uh, <clears throat> and then whether you're going to get entrainment, I mean, um, interface uh, with a rag layer, which crud layer, you might call it in, in SX or an emulsion band. And here in the pictures on the right, you can see very clearly uh, the top one shows an emulsion band when we were running this extraction column an emulsion would build up at the interface now <clears throat> during testing we can see how we can control this interface uh, this emulsion band you know how, uh, the, uh, most effectively and uh, also you can have solids building up at the interface <clears throat> and again you would not know this unless you ran a pilot test and again we would have ways of handling either of these two things in a commercial column during testing, we're looking for entrainment. We're looking for the flood point, which helps us find the maximum capacity. But also during pilot test, we need to find what capacity that we're gonna run at and the efficiency of the extraction column so that we can scale it up and provide the column that's gonna meet the requirements. <coughs> Our pilot plan, and Brendan is there right now, by the way, <coughs> is in Houston, Texas. And he, as you mentioned, for extraction, we typically will test car and Scheibel columns quite often. Uh, car columns can be one inch, two inch, three inch. Scheibel columns are usually three inch. If necessary, we can provide uh, downstream distillation testing, but that's not often required for metals extraction. We have a lot of analytical capabilities because while we're testing, we like to analyze the samples as we go. It helps us to do what we call a step-by-step -step optimization, as opposed to a, you know experimental design, which we find much more efficient and takes a lot less material and time. Now, if there's things that we can't analyze in our pilot plant, we're in Houston, there's a lot of analytical labs. 
you know, so we do work with labs to do analysis outside if necessary. <clears throat> this is just what a typical single column extraction test would look like in our pilot plant. We take your material right out of feed, uh, feed drums or solvent drums that are shipped to us. We pump it through a heat exchanger to control the temperature. We use mass flow meters to, con to monitor and, and then control the, uh, uh, the flow rate into the extraction column. Now, the other critical key here is that this column is almost always a glass shell column because when you can see what's going on during the extraction process throughout this column, it makes it much easier to, you know, to optimize the performance, to see what things you have to modify and optimize in order to get the best performance in that extraction column. It helps you certainly to see when you're going to flood that column and when interspace uh, behavior is going to be problematic. So <clears throat> this, like I said, is a very typical, sometimes when we have, uh, you know, multiple steps, though, we can set up multiple extraction columns in series as well. Uh, to study that. <clears throat> With that said, I want to talk about uh, one specific example of where we did a pilot plant test and then supplied an extraction column to replace some mixer settlers in a in a in a metals plant. And this was a filament. They were this is actually metals recycling. They were taking filaments, digesting it in a strong acid, and then going through extraction to recover. The, uh, the metal of interest in this particular case. So this is what their process looked like. They had three stages of extraction, A, A, A. Then they had three stages of washing. And the reason they needed these wash stages is because coming out of this third extractor, the organic phase would always have too much entrained water in it, aqueous phase, and that would carry impurities and things with it. So they had to have two stages of water wash to make sure that they could, could uh, you know, remove those impurities. And the stripping was very simple. So they had a single stage for the stripping step. Well, they came to us because these three mixer settlers were very badly corroding and they needed to be replaced. Plus they were open head, open top uh, mixer settlers and therefore it was a safety concern. So they were very interested in replacing those with an extraction column. So we took their feed, we took their solvent, we set up a Scheibel column, a three inch diameter Scheibel column in our pilot plant. And in a one week test program, we basically optimized the performance of that Scheibel column, generated the data we needed to scale up to, you know, for the commercial design and with a performance guarantee. But one other very interesting thing we found out during our testing is that with the Scheibel column and designing it correctly, and I'll show that in a minute, we could eliminate any of this water entrainment going over to the uh, to the uh, you know the step B here, where they were water washing out the entrained uh, impurities that were carrying over. And so, by doing that, by eliminating these, you eliminate this waste stream, and that was a big help to them. You know, obviously, minimization of waste treatment is always you know a significant portion of of any uh, process. So when we were all said and done, we, uh, we, we optimized the performance in the pilot test. Uh, that would be the capacity, which sets the diameter, the solvent to feed ratio, the height of the column or number of agitated stages we needed. In this case, it was 20 agitated stages. And of course, the agitation speed. And we, once we optimized that, we used our standard scale up. You can see the column here on the right that we designed. It was about 54 inches, it was 54 inches or 50 inches in, in diameter. And the agitated zone was a little bit more than 13 feet. Like I said, it was only 20 agitated stages. But you can see at the top here, what we did, we put this huge expanded end at the top and that's where we knocked out any of that entrained water because we slowed the velocity now of the liquid leaving the top of the column and that allowed those entrained droplets to drop back into the agitated column. And again, once we installed this in the plant, it meant they did not need that wash uh, step. And this column now has been operating successfully uh, for the past 13 years. So with that, I'll turn the second uh, example over to, uh, to back to Brendan. <clears throat> so the, the last 
pilot test example we want to discuss today was a two-step solvent extraction process to remove halogenated compounds from a wastewater feed stream. Um, <clears throat> this is really similar to the copper solvent extraction process um, I went through earlier. Granted that the uh, what we're looking to recover here isn't copper, but a different compound. Um, the goals of this was really just to yield a wastewater stream that, that contained less than 50 parts per billion um, of the halogenated compounds, and that's leaving the first extraction column on the bottom. And then also to really reduce um, the total volume of that halogenated compound leaving the process. So that's the two downstream processing stream on the right, leaving in that second, second stripping column. Um, so we tested this. Uh, in our pilot plant in Houston, and we used both extraction column technologies. So this is a good example where one process made sense for the Scheibel, and then the other process made sense for the car. Um, the Scheibel column was selected for the extraction step because it had a high density difference between both phases. And when we conducted liquid, liquid equilibrium tests for this process, we observed the fast phase separation time. Um, the opposite was true with the stripping step um, where we're covering a solvent, we saw a slow phase separation time there, and we also had experience with similar processes that tended to emulsify. Um, this test was both done in glass columns, it's a 60 stage Scheibel, and a one inch diameter car with 12 feet of plate stack height. We did have C276 internals in the Scheibel because the feed um, was a bit corrosive. And really, the key here, what I'm showing on the bottom, is that we wanted to reduce the amount of solvent used in the extraction step for the Scheibel, and then also really reduce the KOH solution, which is used in the stripping column, just to really concentrate um, those extracted halogenated compounds and have a low volumetric um, stream leaving that stripping column to reduce the overall downstream processing cost. Um, whenever we run a pilot test, and, and Don kind of mentioned this, we perform a series of runs to optimize each extraction column that we're, we're testing. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the runs here, just kind of in the interest of time. But what we found was that we were able to um, make spec in the extraction step first by using fresh solvent and then by using regenerated solvent. We tested two different feed streams. The second feed stream was a little bit more difficult to, to get all the compounds out than the first. Um, and then we ran a production run using that second feed to generate a bunch of loader organic, which we used to test out the stripping step. And then we ran that stripping step long enough to generate regenerated solvent um, so we could do one more extraction step just to show that the entire process works. Um, we did not scale up this process, but we generated all the data from it so that a modular solvent extraction system um, could be designed built and offered with a process performance guarantee. I did want to mention today um, that we have a good video up on YouTube that goes through um, the car column. Um, essentially, a lot of the things that Don discussed earlier when he was talking about pilot testing, you kind of see that. It's about a 10 minute video. And if you have time, absolutely worth the watch. We have a QR code down here at the bottom, which can be scanned. Or if you just go to YouTube and search for car extraction column, it should come right up. And then Don and I have also written several articles over the years. Um, some of those are, are shown here. Um, and if there's interest, we can provide a PDF of today's presentation so these can be reviewed. Hey, thank you, Don and Brendan. Appreciate you sharing that information with us. Uh, we do have some time for some questions. We can receive a bunch of questions. If we don't get the opportunity to address all these questions in the next 10 minutes, uh, we'll definitely follow up with those, with those answers. And then also, we will be providing a link to the video recording of this presentation and um, also a copy of the uh, webinar slide deck. Let's go ahead and ask a few questions. Uh, first one is for the solids that do end up building up, do they build up in the column or go out with the raffinate or organic? 
Well, uh, let me answer that one. Typically, if they build up at the interface, which is where we usually see solids building up in an extraction column, then when we design the commercial equipment, we always put nozzles around the interface. <clears throat> and therefore, we have, you know, as that solids builds up at the interface over time, you can you can draw that liquid off, go through a side filter and return that liquid back into the extraction column. What we have found in most cases where this is done commercially, it's not something that's done all the time. It's they learn that maybe once a day, once a shift, even once a week, they might have to, you know, draw some liquid off the interface, filter out those solids and then return it back to the column. Um, it when you see it in the column, it looks like a lot of solids, but when you filter it, it turns out oftentimes not to be very much solids. So, I mean, that's mostly how we have seen uh, the solids build up in extraction columns and how we've handled it. Right. And I would just add to that, if, if there is significant suspended solids and they don't build up at the interface and they flow out with the bottom, flowing out with the, the heavy face, stream leaving the bottom of the column a car column is probably the right approach for that type of system and pilot testing of course is, is critical to to learn about the process and, and observe these things thank you another question is um, how do you monitor the degradation of the extractant since most of the vendors don't provide the details of what solvent it is or its properties so I think that the key here really is continuous pilot testing. So if you have a solvent extraction process, which has two columns in series, being able to operate it continuously and taking samples and measuring the concentration of the extractant and performing material balances around it, that's a really good way to see if it's degrading or not. So I think pilot testing there is, is really critical. Okay. Another one is what is meant by turn down capa uh, capability? Yeah, when I talk about turn down, like typically you might design a column for a certain capacity, you know, you know, uh, let's say 100 gallons a minute. But, you know, certainly during startup, you might only be running at 50 gallons a minute or whatever. So, you know, if you design it for 100 gallons a minute, what I'm saying on a four to one turndown is if you run it as low as 25 gallons a minute, it will still <clears throat> operate at peak capacity, uh, peak efficiency. So it just means you can run over a broad range of operating capacities and maintain the same efficiency. And the reason you can do that with an agitated column is because you have control of the agitation speed. As you change capacity, you would change the agitation speed which again keeps the efficiency, you know, basically constant. Okay. Another question is what are the energy requirements and footprint of a Scheibel versus a conventional SX? So the, the energy requirements of a Scheibel or a car, these are low speed devices. So I'd say that most Scheibel columns, it is a bit diameter and size dependent, but most of them I would say are operate at two and a half or two horsepower. That's kind of the size of the motor. And then most car columns would probably be less than five horsepower. So these are not high speed devices like a centrifugal extractor or something like that. These are low speed devices and they have low energy requirements because of that. Yeah, as far as the, you know, the footprint, you know, if you have a uh, two foot diameter extraction column, your footprint is a little, you know, is about maybe around four foot overall, uh, all going up. Whereas you have a, you know, I don't know, 10 mixer settlers, you know, they could take up quite a bit more, uh, you know, space than, than that small foot footprint that you're getting for a, uh, for an extraction column. And to add to that a bit, like using Don's example there, 10 mixer settlers, those are 10 pieces of rotating equipment that you have to manage and, and power as opposed to just a single one in the extraction column. All right, thank you. Another question is, um, what is the maximum flow rate you can design an extraction system for? Well, I, th I kind of tried to point that out, you know, with, with the Scheibel column, the biggest one we've built to date is 650 to 700 gallons a minute combined flow of both phases. 
Now, we feel we can even build bigger than that, to be honest with you. That's just the biggest one we've built to date. The car column <laughs> is a little bit lower. Maybe a, little, a single car column, maybe around 400, 450, maybe as much as 500 gallons a minute combined flow. So if you need more, you might have to put two of those in, uh, in parallel. Okay. Other question is, how do you handle pH? Uh, this is a, a good question. And you can, of course, see like the impact of varying pH as you look at different extracted isotherms for solvent extraction processes. The way we would handle it is by adjusting the pH of the aqueous stream um, entering an extraction column. That's probably the first way we'd run with it. And then also by monitoring the pH throughout the extraction column itself using pH probes and then adding additional aqueous um, alkaline or acid inlet streams to the extraction column as appropriate. And this is something else, you know, we really monitor during pilot testing by having pH probes within the column and then adding those acidic and basic streams as needed to really control that. Because pH control is certainly very critical for, for these types of processes. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a bunch of other questions that came in towards the back end, which we'll respond to after this meeting by email. Um, definitely, you know, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. We do have an email address at the bottom if you do want to reach out to us uh, separately. It's contact at cokemodular.com. Uh, we definitely appreciate everyone joining and thank you very much. Take care. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.